I'd like to welcome everyone to Gardening Green Expo 2023. The Expo is sponsored by the NSRWA, the WaterSmart Program, and Kennedy's Country Gardens. Now, before we start, I want to let you know a little bit about Zoom in case you haven't been on here before. If you have any questions during the presentation, you can paste them into the chat. So if you scroll down to the bottom of your screen, you'll see the word chat. You click on that and the chat will open uh, beside your screen. And then when we get to the end of the presentation, I'll go through the questions. So now I would like to present Doug Tallamy. Thank you, Lori. Uh, today I want to talk about uh, the nature of oaks, specifically the, the species that rely on oaks. We'll talk a little bit about oaks themselves, but mostly about the, the life associated with oaks. But before we do that, I want to remind you about a paper that E.O. Wilson wrote way back in 1987. It was called The Little Things That Run the World, talking about how important insects were. Uh, it was an interesting paper, but it was immediately forgotten. Problem is, uh, it had a very important message. Life as we know it depends on insects. And now we're finding out insects are disappearing. The planet has already lost 45% uh, of its insects. <clears throat> and it's lost those insects because of the way we, we live. Lights kill insects. Neonicotinoids kill insects. And we're using neonics in all those, those light green areas. Deforestation kills insects. Cars kill insects. Climate change kills insects. When you take an area like this and you turn it into that, it kills insects. What does that have to do with oaks? Well, there's no better way to share our spaces with insects than to plant an oak. And there's no better way to share our spaces with lots of things than to plant an oak. And with, that's why I wrote the book, uh, The Nature of Oaks, so that people can understand how important they are. And what we're gonna do is talk about oaks that uh, I, I, my wife and I planted on our property. Um, shortly after we moved in to, this is a, a farm that had been broken up into 10 acre lots in southeastern Pennsylvania. <clears throat> Last thing they did was mow it for hay, uh, but they took it out of mowing three years before we actually moved in. And when you do that, this is what comes back. Um, all the invasive plants from, from Asia. So this is what a property looked like. That is a picture from our property. And there is my wife getting rid of this stuff. Uh, before you can start planting oaks or anything else, you have to control those in, invasives. I know it's a big job. A lot of people think it's impossible, but look at skinny old Cindy here. She did it. Uh, and if she can do it, you can do it. What was I doing? I was I was planting plants, uh, particularly those those oaks. There was a, a couple of oaks, white oaks down the street that uh, had, uh, I guess we call it an oak mass. They dropped a number of acorns that year. So I gathered them up and planted them around the property. Of course, white oaks germinate in the fall. Uh, they send down a, what's called a radical. And that's all they do until the spring. And then they send up their first pair of leaves and that's pretty much all they do that first year. <clears throat> and it gives people the impression that oaks grow very, very slowly. They're not growing slowly. They're just growing uh, mostly underneath, uh, beneath the ground that first year. They're putting on 10 times more root biomass than leaf biomass. Uh, so, and that root biomass will serve them well the rest of their life. Here's our little oak right here. We're going to follow it. It's got a deer cage around it. Because these days, if you don't put a cage around your baby oak, you don't have a baby oak. This is what that tree looked like 18 years later, 45 feet tall, 47 inch circumference, a canopy spread of 30 feet. It's still a baby, of course, but it's a real landscape tree and it didn't take that long. So one of the points I wanna make tonight is that oaks are a, a lifeline to an awful lot of species. There are dozens of species of birds that depend on oaks. Many mammals, uh, including the big guys, uh, bears uh, are, are uh, not only do they eat uh, acorns, but they also overwinter in uh, the hollow oaks, so the very large ones, raccoons, possums, not that many uh, reptiles are associated with oaks, but there are several species of butterflies that specialize on oaks, hundreds of species of moths that depend on uh, oaks, as well as their predators and parasitoids. Um, actually, more than a thousand species of cynipid gall wasps depend on oaks. Many beetles, June beetles, longhorn beetles, metallic wood boring beetles, weevils, uh, are all associated with oaks. And then if you look underneath the tree in the leaf litter on the ground, you've got lots of spiders. You get dozens more species of arthropods and mollusks and annelids that all depend on oaks in one way or another. So it's a very diverse web of life, very diverse community that's associated with oaks. And again, the problem is it goes unnoticed. And if it's unnoticed, it's unappreciated. 
uh, and that is why I wrote The Nature of Oaks. It is a a month-by-month guide to the life that is on your oaks. Uh, And my goal was to provide the knowledge uh, with hopes that it generates interest. Knowledge usually does, does lead to interest. Interest often generates compassion, and then compassion leads to action. We need a lot of action to help nature these days. So first, a few facts. Uh, The genus Aquarcus, that's where the oaks are, contain 91 species in North America, 435 species globally. So it's a large genus uh, as trees go. The word comes from the Celtic quer, meaning fine, and quez, meaning tree, and oaks are indeed fine trees. There are four major taxonomic sections in the genus, and you hear their their names tossed about, so we have to talk about them. The white oak group, it's called the Quercus group. The red oak group, Lobatey. Those are the two common uh, oak groups in the east. Varentes is a live oak group that's uh, more common in the south, and then a much smaller proto balanus canyon oak group in the west. This is the distribution of oaks in uh, the U.S. There is at least one species of oak in every uh, area of the country except the brown. Um, so in the particularly the northern Rockies and the high dry plains here, there aren't any oaks, but every other place there's quite a few. Uh, the center of distribution is in the southeast, but actually if you move into Mexico, there are 200 species of oaks, oaks in Mexico. Oaks live a long time. There are figures from uh, Europe that says oaks live 900 years. 300 years of growth, 300 years of stasis, 300 years of decline, and during each one of those periods of growth, Oaks are delivering unique ecosystem services to the land around them. Now, many of our oaks don't live that long, and we'll talk about why. Uh, we do have some big, big, uh, long uh, lived oaks in this country. The Penchenka oak could be the oldest one, estimated to be 2,000 years old. Uh, but if you really want to look at the oldest oaks, you have to go to very small species like the Palmer oak. Uh, It's kind of a ground cover. It roots itself here and then crawls along and roots itself over here and dies over here. This specimen is estimated to be 13,000 years old. So some of the oak species actually are among the oldest living things on the planet. They can get big. This was the Y oak, the largest white oak in the country in Y, Maryland. Uh, I did get to see it before it blew over. It's just probably been 20 years uh, at this point blew over in a hurricane, uh, but it was huge. One of the points I want to make today, though, is that not all oaks are huge. They're actually small ones that we can use in small yards. And then finally, we're going to stress the fact that oaks have superior ecological function. They have the highest biodiversity value, meaning they are supporting the most species of any tree in North America. They're sequestering more carbon dioxide or more carbon that they get from carbon dioxide. Um, So they're, they're storing carbon. Uh, better than most trees. And that's, of course, very important in terms of climate change. Uh, They are among the best soil stabilizers because particularly those big ones have huge root systems. And it's the root systems that are stabilizing our soils. They make the best leaf litter, meaning it lasts the longest. Uh, A single oak leaf can take up to three years to completely uh, break down. Uh, So it's performing the role, uh, important roles that leaf litter perform longer than other tree species. And all of that promotes healthier watersheds. I started the book in October. Why did I start the book in October? Because that was when uh, my wife, Cindy, said, you should write a book about oaks. And it was October. And I looked out the window, and that is the oak that that we're going to follow uh, primarily. This is the one I planted as as an acorn. Um, And of course, October is when you're noticing acorns. Um, They are, are dropping actively in early October. Uh, So let's focus on acorns for a while. Oaks make a lot of acorns. A single oak can make up to 3 million acorns in its lifetime. And each one of those is a a little rich package of food. It's very high in fat, very high in protein, uh, and many animals depend on it. A number of mammals, again, many, many rodents. But of course, the, the bears we mentioned earlier, they're scouring the woods in the fall, eating as many acorns as they can uh, to put on layers of fat that will help them get through the winter. Uh, But other mammals eat them as well. Raccoons eat them. Squirrels eat them. Uh, Those cute little deer that we all love so much uh, eat a lot of acorns. And then many birds eat acorns, particularly turkeys. They're doing the same things the black bears are doing. They're running around the woods eating as many acorns as possible so that they get enough fat that can get them through the winter. Red belly woodpeckers eat acorns. Titmice eat acorns. Toheys eat acorns. Nuthatches, flickers. Many ducks eat acorns, particularly wood ducks. 
So when an acorn, a viable acorn falls from a tree and lands in water, it sinks. So these ducks will swim down to the bottom uh, of wherever they are and get those acorns, or they, they come out on the, on the land and eat them right off the ground. Even sandhill cranes uh, eat acorns. Uh, in the old days, when we had huge acorn masts in the, in the west, the sandhill cranes would, would uh, spend the fall walking around eating all those, those acorns. So very important for, for vertebrates. A lot of invertebrates depend on acorns as well. This is the acorn weevil larva tunneling out of an acorn, and that's what the adult looks like. They can be really common in acorns. Then there's a group of moths called acorn moths. It's actually several species, but they all look so similar that uh, you need DNA to separate them. The caterpillars live inside the acorns uh, and do pretty much what the acorn weevils do. So you have all these things eating acorns. Uh, and if you go to a tree shortly after they start to fall, maybe a week and a half later, and you look under there, uh, it's utter destruction. You can't find a viable acorn there. The good ones are carried off or eaten or squished. And you might wonder how oaks ever successfully reproduce. Well, this is where a very ancient mutualism between oaks and jays, jays of all the species, uh, come in. They both evolved in what is now the Arctic about 56 million years ago. Wasn't cold there then. Uh, and right away, they got to know each other and like each other. Jays get food from oaks. Uh, what do jays do for oaks? Well, they uh, allow oaks to move farther and faster than any other uh, tree genus in the world. And this is how that works. Jays take those acorns and they store them for winter food. Now, they don't cache them, so they're not burying a whole bunch of acorns in one place. They bury them singly. So they pick up an acorn and then they'll fly up to a mile from the parent tree. And that's the key. That's farther than other uh, things that are moving acorns around. Then they will tap it below the surface of the soil, typically in a disturbed area. And the idea is they're gonna go back in the winter time and have something to eat. Now, if they think another jay has watched them store that acorn, they'll wait around for a few, uh, few minutes and then they'll dig up the acorn and move it because jays know that jays steal acorns. And then again, in the winter time, they're gonna go back and find those acorns. Uh, they're very busy in the fall. A single jay can bury up to 4,500 acorns each fall. But here's the key, they only remember where one out of every four of those acorns uh, is, which means for uh, if they're planting 4,500 acorns, that means they've, if they're burying 4,500 acorns, that means they're actually planting 3,360 oak trees every single year, every single jay. And if they do that a mile from the parent tree, that's why uh, oaks move farther and faster than other trees. It's not just blue jays that are doing this. Again, all the species of jays, we have seven or eight species of jays in this country. This is a scrub jay from Oregon doing the same thing. Jays are not the only birds with a specialized relationship with acorns. This is the acorn woodpecker in the Southwest, very beautiful bird. Also has a specialized relationship with acorns doing pretty much the same thing. They're storing acorns for winter use but they don't store them underground. They store them in little holes that they carved into dead trees. We'll call it an acorn tree. So here's an acorn uh, in here. Uh, and then they, they guard that tree and protect it from other acorn woodpeckers because they become very valuable resources. So there's the acorn stuck in there. They'll, it'll spend the winter in there and then they'll eat it as they get hungry. An acorn tree can, can hold up to, uh, I can't even read my thing, thousands of uh, yeah, 50,000 holes in an acorn tree, all stuffed with acorns. Again, they don't want other acorn woodpeckers stealing them. So family units protect those trees and uh, there's a lot of activity around them. If you happen to have an acorn tree in your yard, it becomes really entertaining. Okay, November is when you might look back and say, well, gee, there were a lot of acorns this year or there weren't very many at all. And if there are a lot, we call it a mast year. And if there aren't very many at all, we don't call it anything. But uh, what we have is very asynchronous production of those egg corns, which is unusual among plants. So ecologists try to explain that. And there are four major hypotheses uh, trying to explain the evolution of oak masting. One would be predator satiation, predator reduction, improved pollination, and energy partitioning. Uh, these are not mutually exclusive. They all could be operating at the same time. So let's talk briefly about each one. Predator satiation. This is an acorn weevil larva outside of an acorn. And as I said earlier, they can be really common in acorns. Up to 90% of the acorns in a tree can have an acorn weevil in it. Um, and 
all those other things that are eating acorns um, can be very numerous as well. So if oaks produce the same number of acorns every year, the populations of the things that eat those acorns would stabilize around that number and they'd eat all the acorns. Uh, so oaks have figured out a way to get around that. They produce a whole bunch one year and you build up the populations of acorn weevils and, and deer and mice and, and all the other things that depend on them. And then the following year, uh, you produce very few acorns or, or no acorns. And the populations of those things that eat acorns crash. That's called predator reduction. Uh, and usually the oaks will go two or three years uh, of very low acorn production, and then they'll have another mast year. So when they have another mast year, the populations of the things that eat those acorns are so low that that's why we call it predator satiation. Now there's more acorns than there are acorn eaters, and the oaks do get to successfully reproduce. Improved pollination. Oaks are wind pollinated, which is a game of chance. This is the uh, male catkin on the, the oaks and they simply release a whole bunch of pollen. Here are the female flowers up here, tiny little, little things. And on a single oak tree, the pollen is released before the female flowers are mature, which means an oak cannot pollinate itself. It needs to have pollen coming in from another oak tree. So if all the oaks release their pollen about the same time, the chances that uh, you get successful pollination are uh, really increased. And that's what you would have in a mast year. And then finally, energy allocation. By the way, if you're wondering whether oaks can have good fall color, they can. This is a scarlet oak uh, in my yard. Energy allocation, there's never enough energy to go, go around. Uh, and oaks tend to, to uh, partition it. They'll use the energy that is available to grow one year, or they'll use it to make a lot of acorns in one year, but rarely do they do both at, in the same year. So again, you add up all four of those hypotheses and um, in some combination, they will explain the evolution of oak masting. December is when you might notice another unusual trait of oaks, particularly oaks in the white oak group, and that is they don't drop their leaves. And this is particularly true of younger oak, oak uh, trees. They'll hold their leaves all the way through the winter. That condition is called marcescence. And again, this is a deciduous tree, uh, so it's very unusual. We've got to explain it. And the leading hypothesis has to do with all those large Pleistocene mammals that used to inhabit the earth not that long ago, nine, 10,000 years ago. Uh, it, this, these are the mammals that were in uh, Mexico, three species of, of um, Mammoths or mastodons, I guess they're mammoths, I always get them confused. The giant sloth could uh, reach up 18 feet. Camels, elk, 44 species of rhinoceros on, on the planet back then. Um, and many of these guys were browsers, meaning uh, just like white-tailed deer today, they're eating woody material on plants all, all winter long, typically the buds on those plants, because that's where the nutrition uh, was. So the thinking is that marcescence allowed uh, oaks to protect their, their buds. They, they kept the uh, leaves from the previous year, the dead leaves around their new buds, uh, which means that the, those mammals could not get a mouthful of bud without getting a mouthful of dead leaves. And all of a sudden it wasn't so, so tasty. Uh, and the distribution of these marcescent leaves supports that hypothesis. They go up about 18 feet, and above that, there's no more marcescent leaves, and that's as high as those mammals could, could reach. Impossible to test today, but it makes a nice story. And marcescence also makes a, a very useful landscape trait. Uh, you can use oaks, particularly in the white oak group, as a screen during the winter time. So if you don't like your neighbor, you can plant a white oak and screen him out all year long. January. Uh, this is cold time of year. We're usually not out looking up in our oak trees, but if we do spend time looking up in, in those trees, you're likely to see little birds flitting around. We tend to think when little birds are flitting around, they're playing, but they're not playing, of course. Energy is always in short supply. By little birds, I'm talking about things like uh, chickadees, things like titmice, things like the uh, golden crown kinglet flitting around our, our trees. I took this picture in my yard um, during a snowstorm a couple of years ago. Well, of course, chickadees and titmice are the birds that are feeders all winter long eating seeds. So we tend to think that's all they need. But actually, only 50% of their diet in the wintertime is seeds. The other 50% is insects and spiders, even in the wintertime. And maybe they're getting insects and spiders up in the tree. Um, but 
the uh, golden crown kinglet is not a seed eater at all. It is entirely an insectivore, uh, and it should have migrated where all the, the insects are to go down south. It doesn't. It stays up north here, flits around our trees. So that, that was the kinglet paradox. What are these birds that should have migrated doing uh, up north, flitting around our trees, um, when we know there's no insects in those trees? All entomologists know that. Uh, except for Bern Heinrich, who is a retired entomologist. He actually writes a uh, natural history column in natural history every month. Uh, and he doesn't like paradoxes. So he actually looked in the crop of golden crown kinglets in Maine in, in January, and he found they were full of caterpillars. So obviously they're getting caterpillars up in those trees in Maine in January. Caterpillars that look like sticks. No wonder we didn't think you know, there were any caterpillars there. They look a lot like sticks and they just sit there. And when it gets really cold, the cells in their bodies uh, don't burst uh, because they've got antifreeze proteins in it. But the caterpillar shrinks a little bit and then it swells a little bit when it gets a little bit warmer. But they just sit there all winter long. And that is what those birds are after as they flit around our trees. So we don't have a, a uh, uh, kinglet paradox anymore. We now know why they're here, but now we have to explain why the caterpillars are there. What are they doing in the trees all winter long? There truly is nothing for them to eat. Uh, and of course, we don't really know what they're doing there. My favorite hypothesis is that um, when you overwinter as a nearly mature caterpillar, you can outcompete anything in the spring. Most, of course, in the spring, you've got these young leaves that, that pop out. Now, if you overwinter as an egg, you're going to hatch out as a very tiny larva, and that big, the big caterpillar can outcompete you. If you overwinter as an adult, and some insects do, um, then you've got to find a mate and lay that egg, and then the egg has to hatch. So again, you're way behind. If you overwinter as a pupa or a chrysalis, same thing. You've got to emerge as an adult, find a mate, lay an egg. So the caterpillars can outcompete any of their competitors and have an unlimited food supply if they make it through the winter. February, this is the quietest time of year, uh, biologically speaking, so it's a good time to talk about what I call oak landscaping myths. Um, I hear this all the time. Everybody's got a good reason why they're not going to use oaks in their, their landscape. One of the best is they're too expensive. Can't use them. They cost too much. Uh, they grow too slowly. I hear people say all the time, if I plant an oak, I won't live long enough to enjoy it. Or they're going to get too big uh, on a small lot. And if we do use them, they'll fall over and crush our house, or they're going to lift up our sidewalk or our, our driveway. We usually associated with myths is some level of fact. At least that's the way it was in the old days. Um, and so let's let's look at each one of these. Fact or fiction? Are oaks too expensive to, to use? Um, well, they can be if you insist on planting a large oak. Nurserymen have learned that we like to plant, we like instant gratification, so they've learned how to grow uh, trees in, in pots and get them big so that we will buy them, and then they can charge you a lot of money. Um, well, in, in uh, not too distant past, uh, it was difficult to do that without having uh, the tree get root bound, where the trees go around and around and around. And if you plant that, they continue to grow and then they strangle the tree. But these are called air pots. It's new technology that allows uh, these trees to grow without becoming root bound. But the root biomass is very small compared to the amount of leaves that it's got to supply. So when you plant a tree like this, survivorship is pretty good, but they have to rebuild that root mass. And they will spend many years doing that without growing at all. Another option, oh, I ran into this, this planting in Newark, Delaware a couple of summers ago. Um, I should have counted the oaks. It was, it was more than 10 that had been planted. Big trees, everybody wanted instant gratification. They spent a lot of money on it and every single one was dead. That's a lot of wasted money. Well, this is the other option, bald and burlap, where you, you chop off all the roots, wrap it up in burlap and sell it very hard on the trees. And again, the first thing it's gonna do if it lives is try to rebuild that, that root mass. Well, if I plant an, an acorn the same day I plant one of these big bald and burlap trees, um, and I actually did that once by accident, uh, in a couple of years, well, several years, let's say the 10 years it takes for those roots to, to uh, reestablish and the tree to start to grow, this little tree will grow up to be bigger and healthier than that tree you spent a lot of money on. Um, so here's an example. This is a willow oak that I planted from an acorn the same day I planted a red oak that was 15 feet tall, bald and burlap. Um, and here they are. <laughs> Obviously the willow oak is much bigger than the bald and burlap tree. This tree has struggled uh, right from the start. 
Um, so it gives you an idea that planting from an acorn uh, does work and you get a very healthy tree. Uh, I'd love to see nurserymen uh, offer oaks at this size. I'm not trying to kill the large tree industry because there's there's times when that's appropriate, but uh, it out outprices a lot of uh, people who would otherwise buy a tree. Um, there are some some sources for uh, oak seedlings. Uh, Maryland uh, State Departments of Natural Resource and Pennsylvania, Virginia occasionally offer them. So look for that uh, either in the spring or fall if you're looking for small oaks. You might you might get lucky. But that brings us to the next question. Are oaks going to grow too slowly? Um, are we really going to be dead before uh, we can enjoy them? Well, let's have a race here. This is the oak that we're following, the one I planted as an acorn. We're going to race uh, between um, this white oak and my little friend, Bella. No, she's not my daughter. No, she's not my granddaughter. She was our surrogate granddaughter until we found real ones. A um, friend of ours uh, lent us Bella. She was born on my wife's birthday. She spent a lot of time at, at our house and she loved this this tree. So here she is two years old. This tree is six years old at this point. Uh, but you know, oaks grow really slowly. Bella can catch up, I'm sure. Let's have a race. There's the tree. It's seven years old, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Bella's losing. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. 2020, Bella's got her mask on, so we always know when it is. She has clearly lost the race, and she did a good job. She's 5'11", but the oak did a better job. So I'm going to throw that as a myth. Oaks do not grow too slowly. A little slow in the beginning, you'd be a little patient, and you get a real landscape tree. And if you start young, you can get it for free. And the important thing to remember is that even tiny oaks contribute energy to local food webs. And that's one of the new goals in, in our landscaping. We want to put plants that are going to support the wildlife around us, and oaks are the best at doing that. So this is a pin oak that has just popped its head above the leaves, and there's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that tree. You don't have to wait decades or hundreds of years for your oak to start to contribute. It will contribute the very first year. Are oaks too big to use in small landscapes? Well, no landscape designer and no landscape architect is going to spec an oak for a, a yard this size, but they used to. Uh, driving into uh, the University of Delaware, uh, I passed, there's a whole, whole row of uh, large red oaks and pin oaks in very tiny yards. And I'm sure they were planted the same time these houses were built. And I'm sure that was more than a hundred years ago. Uh, but remember hundred years ago, there was no air conditioning. So these oaks lowered the temperature of, of that house by at least 10 degrees. It was an important ecosystem service. They have not lifted up the hardscape. They have not fallen over and crushed the house. Uh, so all is well so far. This is a very large oak in front of a large church in um, Chestertown, Maryland. This is a large uh, Quercus gariana, the uh, Oregon white oak or the Gary oak uh, in a tiny little yard in Portland, Oregon. So it does happen. You can, you can see where it happened in the past. Point I want to make, though, is that we do have smaller options. In the east, we've got the dwarf chestnut oak, Quercus prinoides. That's the one that's most available. Uh, Georgia oak has been in the trade uh, in the past. It's actually an endangered species, but um, occasionally they offer it. The uh, yellow ones are the, the small species of oaks that are, live in Texas alone. Um, so there are the, the uh, Quercus virginiana is the Live oak in the south, there's a, a dwarf variety, not variety, it's, it's a, a subspecies. Uh, so we can get oaks that are smaller for small yards, uh, and, and we need to get more of them into the trade. This is a dwarf chestnut oak in my yard that produced acorns when it was five feet tall. Here's another option though, coppice your oaks. Coppicing is, is when you let your oak get maybe three or four inches in diameter, then you cut it off at the base and it comes back as a bush. I, I got this picture off, off the web. Um, I don't know if it was an accident, but it's a way of getting the foliage of oaks into your yard without having a very large tree. This is a Quercus gariana in, uh, again, Portland, Oregon. And again, I don't know if it's an accident, but there it is. If you coppice it, you can get a very valuable tree in a small space that otherwise would be very big. You can coppice it forever. For the next hundred years, keep cutting it off every time there's a tall leader and you'll end up with a, an oak bush. But what happens when you do have a large tree in your yard? Is it going to fall over and, and crush your house? Uh, well, we all know that that does happen. Uh, and it's not just oaks that do that. Uh, large trees are blowing over all the time these days. 
uh, for two reasons. We're getting really crazy weather for one thing. And by the way, if it does blow over, you will hear about it. The news, they all made a pact. They will only report bad news. You are never going to hear about the oak that did not blow over. Um, but the reason they're blowing over is because of the way we're planting them. We plant every tree as a specimen tree, which means it's separated from all other trees to the point where it can't interlock its roots with any other tree. Then you get a lot of rain and a lot of wind and boom, over they go. This is the way trees grow in a forest. They grow close enough that their, their roots are interlocked and it's a very stable matrix. This is a stream cut uh, near, near my house that shows what happens when uh, trees are growing closely together. They don't have to be the same species. They interlock the roots. So the one, two, three, four trees here, very stable matrix. So rather than this, we should think about planting tree groves. Could be oak groves, they could be mixed groves where you have at least two trees growing together. These are the oaks that I got the acorns from originally when we moved in, three foot uh, distance here. Nobody planted these, they, they planted themselves and then they put the road in afterwards. Here are three red oaks in uh, Northwest Connecticut called the Three Sisters. You can find trees very close together in nature all the time. Will they be as large and splendid as they would if they had been uh, separated? No. Uh, but if you view them as a group, um, it still can be aesthetically pleasing and they're much more stable. This is the planting at Mount Cuba Center in Hokesson, Delaware, one of the, uh, the uh, DuPont estates. And this one's dedicated to native plants. Large red oak back here, hemlocks here, large roadies down here, even some hardscape. This is a planned landscape. This entire area used to be a cornfield. Um, but it looks totally natural. It's providing uh, natural habitat. It's extremely stable. All these trees are interlocking their, their roots. So if you, if you find yourself with four or five acres of, of lawn and you're saying, I'd like to reduce that, consider planting a tree grove like this. It's beautiful and it's functional. Are our oaks going to lift up hardscape? They can, depending on what you plant them over. If you plant them over bedrock, yes, they will. The roots will go laterally. Uh, this is a large pin oak, uh, obviously has not lifted up this, this driveway at all because it was planted in soil that was deep enough. Another reason that oaks can lift up hardscape is if you plant them over agricultural pan. So if you know you live on what was once a farm that was plowed for a uh, hundred years, the plow would go down 15 inches or so and, and then stop. And over the years, the area below that plow, that plow became really compacted. That's called pan uh, and it, it's hard. So the roots will go down and hit that pan and then they go laterally and they can also cause trouble. But it doesn't have to happen. These are uh, very large red oaks at the University of Maryland. Again, large trees right next to the curb, no problem at all. If you find you've got pan, break it up. Get that pickaxe, get down there, break up the pan, the roots will go deep uh, and you'll be, you'll be fine. March, this is when the leaves uh, actually start to, to drop, those marcescent leaves uh, and the leaf leaves start to form what we call leaf litter uh, and perform important functions on the ground. So let's talk about uh, oak leaves for a few minutes. They are extremely valuable. A lot of people think all oak leaves have lobes, uh, but they do not. By the way, this would be the red oak group because it's got pointy lobes. This is the white oak group because it's got rounded lobes, but there are oaks with no lobes at all. That's a shingle oak. This is a water oak. This one looks like holly, uh, the emery oak from uh, Arizona. This is the uh, willow oak leaf, live oak leaf, a lot of variation in, in oak leaves. And oaks make a lot of leaves, 700,000 leaves on a big tree. And if you lay them next to each other on the ground, they will cover four tennis courts. And that is their job, to cover the ground. When leaf litter covers the ground, it protects the moisture in the ground. And that is necessary for all of the soil organisms to exist. And that includes the mycorrhizae, that are essential for uh, transferring nutrients to our plant roots. Uh, so the creatures that live in the uh, soil, and there are a lot of them, there are more species underground than above ground, um, their job is to break down that leaf litter and return the nutrients to the soil so that the tree can use them again in future years. Um, all the, the nutrients that the tree is using is tied up in those leaves. And when we rake them away every year, we're depriving that tree of nutrients. It's one of the main reasons that our oaks don't live as long as, as uh, they could. It's because we deprive them of the food they need. A lot of people say, I cannot leave those leaves uh, in my beds because then my plants won't get through them. I stopped and took this picture. This is a fern uh, 
community. I mean, nobody planted it and it's going through the leaf litter, no problem at all. Plants are much better at getting through uh, leaf litter than, than we give them credit for. Um, so here's at my house, I'm never home. I don't have a chance to, to rake it all, but this is wood poppies coming through uh, the oak leaf litter. Um, this is uh, native pachysandra leaf litter. Um, there's a lot of things that do very fine uh, in, in beds with a lot of leaf litter. This is Virginia creeper. Um, so, so consider leaving oaks or leaves in your, your flower beds, um, at least some of those leaves, and many of your plants will come on, come right through and, and, and be fine. If you look in that leaf litter, it is teeming with life. 250,000 mites per square meter of oak leaf litter, 100,000 springtails like the Sminthurid um, uh, columbulin, 90,000 proturans, those are very primitive insects, very, very tiny, a million nematodes, a lot of life there. And again, those things are breaking down the leaves and returning the nutrients to the soil. Uh, and some of our prettiest butterflies uh, actually eat oak leaf litter like the banded hair streak. It's not an uncommon butterfly, uh, but that's what the larvae eat. I've never found a, a larva because it's tough to find in there. Um, so, but if you rake those leaves away, you've lost the banded hair streak. You've also lost 70 species of what we call litter moths. Things like the ambiguous litter moth, the American idea, the dark spotted palthus, and 67 others are have caterpillars in those dead leaves eating them all the time. When you see birds flicking the leaves in, under your tree, like things like white-throated sparrows and towhees are doing this little dance, pushing the litter aside, they're looking for these guys. They're looking for the caterpillars and the pupae and sometimes the adults of these guys, but only if you leave the leaf litter there. And then of course, they're the predators that are eating all of those, those living things, lots of ground beetles, lightning bugs. People say, ah, I don't see the lightning bugs like I used to, the fireflies. That's what an adult firefly looks like. They're not flies and they're not bugs. They are beetles. And of course, they have this luminescent organ. But that's what the larva looks like. Looks like a little dinosaur. It is a predator in leaf litter, but only if we keep the leaf litter around. So if you've lost your, your lightning bugs, um, you've lost your leaf litter, or you hire a uh, uh, one of the lawn care companies to come and spray your lawn and of course kill these things. So if you get your, your lightning bugs back, you're doing many things correctly. Okay, April. This is when uh, the buds first start to, to uh, break out on, on your oak. It's also the chance to see one of the most ephemeral biological interactions that, that uh, occurs anywhere on the planet. It takes about five minutes uh, each year. Um, and it happens frequently, but only for five minutes. So you have to be out there looking at the right time. And I'm talking about when cynipid gall wasps lay their eggs in the buds of your, your oaks. Uh, and that's what's going on here. This is a female cynipid. She is injecting an egg, that's her ovipositor right there, into this bud. This is a male who has already mated with her uh, and he fathered this egg, but he's riding her because she's gonna go to another bud and lay another egg and he wants to make sure he's the father of that egg as well. This is a male who wishes he was that male. So what's she doing? She's laying an egg in the, the bud, but she's also injecting plant hormones that will direct the growth of the cells of this, this bud. These are stem cells. These are meristematic cells that can uh, be shaped into lots of different forms depending on the hormones that they're bathed in. So we've got a compromise between the hormones injected by the cynipid and the hormones that are already in in the bud that come from the oak tree as well. And the, the result is a species specific gall that is created. Uh, you can recognize the species of cynipid that made the gall based on the shape of the gall. And there are a lot of galls, more than a thousand species of cynipid gallers on, on oaks. Um, a single oak tree can support 70 different species of gall. It's very hard to find an oak that does not have galls on it. Uh, another interesting thing about galls is that many of them are hollow. This is the apple oak gall or the oak apple gall. I've seen it written both ways. And if you cut it open, it's mostly hollow. There's a sphere in the middle and that's where the cynipid larva is. It's inside this very hard sphere. Then you got a lot of space and then the outside of the gall. What's that all about? Well, it turns out that cynipid uh, gallers have more parasitoids, more natural enemies, other species of wasps that attack them with very long ovipositors, lay their eggs in them, and then the larvae of these, these uh, parasitoids develop in the cynipid. This is in the family Pteromidae, uh, and the 
hollow space in the gall has got to be bigger than the length of this ovipositor so that she cannot reach that, that galler. The galls start out small, and that's when they're really vulnerable to those, those terimid uh, wasps, but they grow very quickly and soon surpass the length of that ovipositor so that the galler is safe. This is a uh, terimid in California, Terimus californicus, and it's got the longest ovipositor because those galls are huge out there. Um, actually, the biggest gall in the country. This is on, uh, again, Gary Oak. It's the biggest gall because those ovipositors are so long. It's got to be big to separate the galler from their natural enemies. A lot of variation in, in gall uh, morphology. Uh, some of them are quite pretty. Many of them are, are round uh, and they occur on, on leaves or they occur on stems. Some of them look like candy. Some of them look like that. Some of them look like diseases. A lot of people mistake them for plant diseases. Um, this is called the spindle gall. That's another one of those candy ones. California has a lot of, a lot of crazy galls. I've got to get out there and take some pictures of them. This is one that looks like pottery in my yard. Um, I, this is the cutest of all. I call it the little gnome house gall. So that hole there, it's not a door for the gnome. It's where the galler has, has left. It's exited. Uh, and then the gall remains on the tray. The brain gall. This is an interesting one. Um, there's four galls on a single leaf, and the cynipid laid a whole bunch of eggs in each gall, and each one of them has emerged. Those are the emergence holes. So this single leaf produced hundreds of cynipid gallers. Uh, galls have also played an interesting role in uh, our, our written history. If you grind up a gall like this and combine it with particular chemicals, it makes an indelible black ink. And that is the ink that our recorded history was recorded with for thousands of years. The Bible was written with gall ink. The Magna Carta was written with gall ink. The Declaration of Independence was written with, with gall ink. Uh, the monks and the scribes, Leonardo da Vinci, they all used gall ink to record uh, what they did. So that's a, a little factoid you can share at your next cocktail party. May, this is when those leaves really uh, branch out, really leaf out. Uh, and it's when the, the biological activity for the, from the oak really takes off uh, in the new year. Of course, this happens all over the temperate zone. You've got uh, the, the emergence of leaves. And following the emergence of those leaves comes the caterpillars that eat those leaves. And following the caterpillars that eat those leaves comes the birds that eat those caterpillars. It is no coincidence that bird migration is timed very closely to match up with the appearance of the caterpillars on leaves, particularly oak leaves. Birders know that if you want to find uh, particularly warblers, you go to oaks. And you go to oaks because that's where those caterpillars are. I had a uh, student, Christy Beal, several years ago, who measured the length of time that uh, warblers were foraging on different tree families. This is the Fagaceae, that's where the oaks and the beeches and the chestnuts are. And these were big trees in cemeteries. Uh, well, there were no uh, beaches and chestnuts in her study site. So this was all oaks. Then we have pines and we've got birches and, and so on. You can see where the birds are spending their time. They're spending their time in the oaks because that, again, is where the caterpillars are. Remember in the spring, the plants have not made any berries. They haven't made any seeds. These, these birds are all seeking the caterpillars that are high in fat and high in protein. Things like the, the purple crested slug, the buck moth, the white marked tussock moth, the saddle prominent, double line prominent, the white dotted prominent, the checkered fringe prominent, uh, the laugher, the lace cap caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the skiff moth, the white blotched heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the banded tussock moth, the red line panapoda, the yellow neck caterpillar, the smaller parasa, the unicorn caterpillar, the crown slug. These guys are called slug caterpillars because their head is tucked up underneath, not because they're really slugs. The street dagger moth, the, less, the epilated dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the uh, red humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the confused wood grain, the spiny oak caterpillar, the um, spun glass caterpillar, which is my favorite in, in the entire country, and literally hundreds more species of, of caterpillars live on oaks. I've been taking pictures of every species of, of caterpillar that I'm, or, yeah, of, of moth that I'm finding in my yard for the last five years, and I'm up to 1,199 species of moths. By the way, this is what our house looks like today after we put the plants back. 
28%, almost 30% of the moths that I'm finding in our yard are on my oaks, which means oaks are really important in terms of producing the food that all of those birds need. And that's why we got birds breeding on our yard. 60 species of birds have bred on our yard so far because we've got the bird food there. They, they use a lot of caterpillars to feed their, their babies. Uh, and it's why I call oaks keystone species. Remember what a keystone is. It's the stone in the middle of the arch. And if you take that stone out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, if you take keystone plants out of the local food web, the food web collapses because they are making most of the food. Just 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. And oaks are making more caterpillar food than any other plant in the country. Over 950 species of, of caterpillars use oaks nationwide. Why do we need so many caterpillars? Well, again, so many things eat caterpillars. Caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we design landscapes that don't have a lot of caterpillars in them, they're going to be failed food webs and eventually failed ecosystems. And it's not just the migrants that are eating those caterpillars. The resident birds are as well when it comes time to reproduce. You've probably all heard the statistic from Carolina chickadee. 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to make one clutch of a Carolina chickadee, depending on the number of chicks in the nest. And that's just to get them to the point where they leave the nest. After they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days. But they're flying all around, so nobody's been able to count them. But you're really talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars to make a bird that's a third of an ounce, four pennies worth of bird. And that's why oaks are so important. They're making all those caterpillars. Okay, June, uh, I'm gonna call this cicada month. That's when the, the periodical cicada uh, emerges. It came out at our house. I guess that wasn't last year, but it was a year before that. Uh, and many of you experienced it, but many of you didn't. So let's go uh, talk briefly about the periodical cicada. There are two broods, the 17-year brood and the 13-year brood, which means they spend 17 years underground as nymphs and then all come out at once. Uh, we know it's going to happen, which means the media gets a hold of it. The media does not like nature for some reason. They like terrible things. And they try to make wonderful things, terrible things, by telling you things that aren't quite true. Uh, like the, the cicada emergence is going to be a terrible scourge. We should all fear it. Um, it's, they're going to sing so loudly that you would go crazy and kill your babies. It's an invasion. You might consider moving uh, before it occurs. I heard all of that on the radio, and they were serious, unfortunately. None of those things are true. Uh, it's one of the most fantastic biological events that you will ever be privileged to witness. It was a big one. Uh, this last last time. These were the shed skins in uh, front of my building at, at uh, University of Delaware next to a big oak. <clears throat> and when they come out of the ground, of course, they aerate the ground. You don't have to pay anybody to do this. That allows oxygen and water into the roots, very healthy for the trees. It was a big one. There were a lot of cicadas around, so many that 11 Mississippi kites flew up from who knows where uh, and stayed around two weeks eating the cicadas in, in uh, our area in Southeast Pennsylvania. So this is what happens. The uh, nymph comes out at night, hangs upside down from a, a branch, splits its, its skin, and then emerges as an adult. It closes as an adult, swings up and hangs from the top there. Now it's like a soft shell crab at this point. Um, anything can eat it. And that's why it happens at night. It's gotta be in secret. It hangs there until it tans its exoskeleton, hardens it up, hardens it up. Uh, and that's what it looks like when it's ready to go. And what it does is fly off and start its very short adult life. The males will go to a, a favorite spot and start to sing. And by sing, what they're doing is vibrating membranes in their thorax to produce a buzzing sound. And they wanna be as loud as they can because the louder they are, the more chances they have of actually attracting a female. Females like loud males because it's a, it's a signal of male health. That male was lucky, a female came uh, and, and they're mating now. Now it's the female's turn. She's got to lay eggs in the stems of, of trees. So here's one laying eggs in a pin oak stem in my, my front yard. There's her ovipositor there. She's jamming it into the, the twig and she's going to insert an egg into that, that branch. <clears throat> 
just to see how hard this is, you should take a pin and try to push it into the stem of a, a an oak twig. You're going to bend the pin, but she manages to do it. She gets it all the way in there. Then she lays an egg. Then she lays another one and another one, another one right down seven or eight in a row. Then she'll go to another branch and do the same thing. And from the point where she lays the eggs on out, uh, often, not always, but often it causes the branch to die. That's called flagging. People get upset. They say, these cicadas are going to kill my, my tree. Um, no, they're going to prune your tree once every 17 years. Uh, and that might not be so bad. Just to show that they do prefer some trees over another. This is an oak tree here. Uh, this is not an oak tree, not a bit of flagging on it. <clears throat> and I had a student who was uh, interested in, in seeing which trees they preferred. So he counted, he measured flagging in a standardized way, again, in Newark, Delaware. Uh, and the trees with the most flagging, the green bars here, uh, were all oaks. So they do lay on a lot of trees, but they do seem to prefer oaks. And then they die. Again, only takes about three, three weeks. The outstanding question, of course, is why stay underground for 17 years? Uh, and the answer is probably predator satiation again. <clears throat> There's no predator that can specialize on uh, something that, that uh, only comes out once every 17 years. They're not going to wait 17 years to have their next meal. Uh, and a lot of things eat, eat cicadas. So um, if they came out uh, just dribbling here and there, uh, it'd be very hard for them to maintain their, their population. But if they come out by the zillions, only periodically, there won't be enough predators to eat them all. July, this is uh, when I, I say the night chorus begins. <clears throat> and by night chorus, I'm talking about katydids. Uh, male katydids. This is a male katydid, and this is a sclerotized portion of its forewings. It raises its wings and rubs them back and forth. There's a scraper and a file there, and it makes a very typical katydid sound. Uh, and if you're wondering why they do that, this is why. Once upon a time, there was a young woman named Katie who fell in love with a handsome young man. Alas, he did not share her feelings, and he married another. Soon thereafter, he and his young bride were found poisoned in their bed. Who perpetrated the crime was never determined, but some say the insects in the tree were watching that night, and each summer they solved the mystery by singing, Katie did, Katie did. If you've ever done any camping in the east uh, in the summertime, you'll hear that, that sound. I camped a lot in North Jersey as I was growing up, the very, very uh, wonderful sound. There are four species of Katie dids that frequent our oak forests. Um, only one species in, in the far west. So uh, the katydids are happening in, in the east. This is a female. She's not mature yet. She hasn't expanded her wings, but her ovipositor is ready to go. Uh, and here she is. She has expanded her, her wings. Um, why are those katydids so loud? For the same reason. The females prefer the loudest males because that's a signal of male health. So she takes this big ovipositor and she lays, she glues these big fat eggs to twigs um, and occasionally people find them and wonder what they are. These have already hatched, uh, but um, and often those eggs are glued to the twigs way up at the canopy, so we don't see them very much. Um, the katydids will sing uh, usually mid-July, all through July, all through August, and into September, depending on when it gets cold in, in your area. Speaking of August, by August, oak leaves have gotten pretty tough. In the spring, uh, they're nice and pliable. A lot of things can eat them, but by August, they're kind of like boards. They have been, uh, lignans and tannins have been pumped into those leaves all season long. It's a wonderful defense against most things that want to eat oak leaves, but the uh, caterpillars that do eat oaks in August have uh, adaptations to get around that, uh, and one of them is eating gregariously, feeding gregariously. Uh, they all eat together. Apparently a number of mouths together can get through the tough material easier than, than a single mouth. This is the yellow neck caterpillar when it's young. Here it is when it's older. It's a pretty big caterpillar. It's eating a lot of oak leaf material. Uh, orange humped oakworm, there are uh, a number of species, the pink striped oakworm that are using gregarious behavior to get around that leaf toughness. But people see uh, this mass of caterpillars eating oak leaves and they get all upset. It's going to kill my, my oak. I walked around the tree that we're following here in 2014 uh, and just it counted the caterpillars on the lower parts of, of uh, the tree. I didn't climb any ladders at all. And just on the lower parts, there were 410 caterpillars. 115 of them were those large yellow neck caterpillars. 
And then I stood back and took this picture so I could ask you, how many of those caterpillars do you see? Don't tell me you see any. I know you don't. How much of caterpillar damage do you see? You don't see that either. And this is the distance at which we view our trees. But if I knocked on your door and said, you got 410 caterpillars eating your oak tree, most people would freak out, call the man, get the spray can, save the tree. You don't have to save the tree. Oaks are really good at passing on part of the energy they've harnessed from the sun to other animals so that we have other animals. Whoops. I met a, uh, a woman, Tammany Baumgarten, in New Orleans several years ago, and she had, was very wise. She suggested that we all practice the 10-step program. We should take 10 steps back from our trees and all of our insects problems disappear. And I think that's wonderful advice. Okay, the other way that uh, insects can get around, particularly caterpillars, can get around those very tough oak leaves in August is to become a leaf miner get really, really small and only eat the innards of the leaf. The toughness is in the, the uh, upper and lower epidermis, but the, the palisade mesophyll, the parenchymal cell tissues are uh, nutritious, they're full of, of moisture. Uh, and that's what those tiny little leaf miners eat. So by tiny, I mean tiny. The egg was laid here. Uh, this is a little moth and it mind. This is called a serpentine mine because the mine kind of looks like a snake. The dark area here is its frass, its poops that it pushes to the middle, pupated here, and that's all the leaf material it's going to eat in its entire life. This is a blotch leaf mine. There's the caterpillar in there. It just kind of goes in a circle making a, a blotch. Here it is backlit, and here it is with a very nice picture from Salvador Vitanza. Uh, so it doesn't look much, much like a caterpillar because it's got all those adaptations to uh, be a tiny leaf miner. But when it comes out as an adult, it looks just like a moth. It is a moth. This is one of the Camomaria species on oaks. Solitary oak leaf miner, gregarious oak leaf miner, the oak tentiform leaf miner, lots of species of leaf miner on oaks in August. September. This is our last month. Uh, this is when you start to, to hear those crickets outside. Uh, and remember, if, if and they're usually black guys on the ground, if a cricket gets into your house and sings, it's good luck. So you certainly don't want to kill it. But there are crickets up on trees and bushes. We call them tree and bush crickets. And they're not black. They're yellow or, or um, sometimes light, light brown. Uh, and they're on our oak trees as well. Uh, and they're doing the same thing that cicadas and katydids are doing. The males are singing to attract females. But they're very smart about it. They want to send the message that they are uh, really healthy by being as loud as possible. So they find a hole in a leaf or they chew a hole in a leaf. They stick their head through it, raise their wings, make their, their little chirping sound. Most leaves are, are uh, have a slight parabolic shape to it and it projects the sound farther and um, louder than if he sang on a flat surface. So believe it or not, he's actually sending a false signal to the female. He's saying, I'm big and loud when he may not be as loud as he really is. If you can believe that a male would send a false signal to a female. And the female falls for it. She comes, she mates with him, but she may not be a total loser because he might not be the loudest male, but he might be the smartest male. September is also a good time to look for walking sticks. Uh, they're up in the canopy most of the summer. Um, this is one that was on an emery oak in Arizona. Uh, they're called walking sticks because they look like sticks and they walk. This is the species in the east that we're most likely to uh, run into. Um, they have an interesting life history. They will walk around the uh, canopy of the tree in the summertime and the females will drop eggs to the forest floor. Some of those eggs hatch that year. Some of those eggs wait a year and hatch the next year. And a few eggs wait two years before they, they hatch. That's called bet hedging. Um, they are, are uh, in case conditions get really bad one year, there are a few eggs that won't hatch that year and uh, she will actually succeed in reproducing. So there's eggs around the forest floor. Now comes an interesting interaction with spring ephemerals. This of course is bloodroot. Bloodroot makes these, these uh, pods and inside those pods are seeds. Those seeds are, are attractive and they got a little white thing attached to them called eliosomes. These eliosomes apparently evolved in order to attract ants. Ants love to eat them. So the ants will come, they'll pick up the seed, take the seed back to the nest. Everybody eats the eliosome. They can't eat the seed itself. It's too hard. So they throw it in the garbage dump of the ant nest. All ant nests have garbage dumps, which is about an inch below the soil surface. It's a perfect place for these spring ephemeral seeds to germinate. 
Well, these are uh, walking stick eggs, and it looks like they're trying to be like a uh, spring ephemeral uh, seed. They have a white stripe here that could look like a, a, uh, a liosome. I bet there's some chemical mimicry, uh, which makes them very similar to a liosomes, but the ants fall for it. They pick them up, they carry them back to the nest. They can't eat them, so they put them in the garbage dump, and that's the safe place that those walking stick eggs spend the year until they hatch. All right, we've made it through the year talking about just a few of the things that occur on the oaks right in your, your yard. So let's end um, talking about a crisis, but we're, we're gonna solve the crisis, it's okay. It's the biodiversity crisis. Yeah, we've got climate change, but we also have a biodiversity crisis. Um, and if we had no climate change, we would still have a biodiversity crisis. And it's just as serious as climate change. This is when we've created, we hear about birds disappearing, you know, three, three billion fewer birds today than there were 50 years ago. Insects disappearing. They're not disappearing. We're killing them. We're killing our birds. We're killing our insects. We're killing nature. And that's why we're in the sixth great extinction event that uh, the planet has ever experienced. So it is a global crisis, and I mean crisis, but it has a grassroots solution. It's one that you and I and everybody can participate in turning around. There are four things that every single landscape has to do today if we're going to reach that sustainable relationship with the natural world that supports us. And I suggest we do reach that. Carbon capture. Every landscape has to capture carbon and store it, help climate change. Every landscape has to manage the watershed. Every landscape has to support a diverse community of pollinators. And every landscape has to support a complex food web. Those are the four jobs of, of your landscape. When you plant an oak, you are addressing all four of them. You're going to plant a tree that will capture more carbon over its life than almost any other tree. Uh, it's going to manage the watershed better than other trees because of those big root systems. It's going to support a more complex food web than any other uh, tree group. It's even going to support pollinators, even though it's wind pollinated. Who knew? These are the male catkins. They're loaded with pollen and, and spring bees are coming into the pollen, taking that pollen um, all spring long, as long as it's being dropped. Um, so get binoculars this spring. When your oaks put down catkins, look up there, you will see these bees. Now they're not pollinating. They're not moving it to the female flowers. They're just taking it for their own use. And that's a good valuable resource for our spring bees. Despite all those wonderful landscape attributes, our oaks are in trouble these days uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. First of all, we cut down most of the giants that used to frequent our forest where those black bears overwintered and so many other things depended on. We cut them down for, for farming or for the lumber that they supplied. The percentage of oaks in our eastern forest has been cut in half in the last 150 years uh, because of, of uh, the way we lumber and we've suppressed fire. Those ground fires that the Native Americans used to uh, manage the landscape with, it favored oaks. Um, and so we got rid of that. And now we've got a whole, a whole bunch of other trees that are competing with our oaks. We've introduced a bunch of serious diseases for our oaks. Sudden oak death, death syndrome, uh, oak leaf scorch, oak wilt, they're taking a terrible toll on our oaks and all kinds of, of uh, insect pests, particularly the spongy moth, used to be the gypsy moth, um, has killed you know, lots and lots of oaks. Um, so these non-native insects are taking a terrible toll as well. Deer overabundance. I cannot overemphasize how important deer overabundance is, how, how, how much it's clobbering oaks and other trees as well. Any young tree that pops its head up in our forest is eaten by deer now because they're 10, 15 times over the carrying capacity of our forests. They're completely destroying the understory. Uh, and we fragmented our forest to the point where a lot of times the pollen from one oak doesn't reach another oak. They're too far separated. And because of all of those perturbations, we've uh, 28 of our 91 North American oak species are now threatened one third of the global oaks are actually endangered for the same reasons. The Oregon white oak that we've talked about a couple of times, Quercus gariana has lost 97% of its range. It used to occur from Southern California all the way up through, through Washington state. There are 2,300 species that rely on oaks in Great Britain that are now threatened because of the loss of oaks in Great Britain. Well, we humans live our life out in a very brief period of ecological time, and then we cannot return those giant oaks to the forest during that time period but we can start the process. Uh, and the wonderful thing is that in no time at all, our oaks will, will assume their role as keystone plants in our landscapes. They're not gonna be 400 years old, but they can still do almost all the other things that oaks do.
we all are responsible for good earth stewardship. Every single person, uh, whether you're a tree hugger or not, because we all need good earth stewardship. We all depend on healthy ecosystems. And the best way to exercise your responsibility to good earth stewardship is to embrace the power of oaks. So for the sake of turkeys, chickadees, woodpeckers, warblers, jays, thrushes, sake of our lightning bugs, our cynipid gallers, our weevils, our orthopterans, our moths, ourselves for our own sakes, plant an oak, plant a living community, plant the future. Thanks very much. That was awesome. Okay, we've got some questions for you. The first one is, in the beginning, there were numerous creatures. Are those worldwide or in North America or in the US? Numerous creatures, you mean all the things eating acorns and um, most of those are in my yard. <laughs> okay. Now, this is, um, you know, many of the, uh, the species from North America compared to the temperate zone in, in Europe, are similar, they're different species, but they're doing very similar things. All the pictures I showed you are from North America, and most of them really are from uh, the East. And okay. again, most of them really are from my yards. Okay, that kind of answers the next question. Did you take all the photos of the oak caterpillars? Yes, I did. Caterpillars are easy to take a picture of. The hard part is finding the caterpillar. Uh, and everybody says, how do you do that? The real trick is go out at night. They're pretty easy to find at night. They're hiding from the birds during the day. Don't look in the springtime because the birds have eaten them all. Look in the end of July or early August. That's when you're most likely to find a lot of caterpillars. Okay. If so, how do you get photos high up? The leaves are coming out about 30 feet high and higher. Are you climbing? No, um, but they're not coming up 30 feet high at my house. Because remember, I planted them as acorns and I did not trim off the lower branches. And I planted them where there were no other trees. So they're big and spreading with low branches. It's very easy to walk around and look at those leaves. Okay. I'd like to plant an oak near the street in my yard to replace a maple that blew down. Tall is okay. What do you recommend? What about oak wilt and or other diseases? Uh, well, I recommend, uh, you, you know, street trees these days ought to be fairly small. They're going to go up and hit the wires or their roots go out and, and it's an issue. So I recommend one of those smaller dwarf varieties, Quercus prinoides again, the dwarf chestnut oak is, is wonderful. The oak diseases, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, there really is not much you can do other than plant all the oaks you can. And the reason I say that is what's going to solve the oak disease problem is resistance that already exists in the populations. So I hear, I hear uh, arborists say, don't plant an oak, it's going to get sick and die. I say plant 10 oaks and find out which one's going to die and which one's not going to die. That's the resistant one. Uh, that is going to spread its acorns and we're going to replace the, the susceptible genotypes with resistant genotypes. I've lost uh, three black oaks in my yard and two red oaks so far, but I've got a number that uh, look just, just fine. They're the resistant ones uh, and they're going to be the future. If we stop planting oaks now, we're going to lose them from our ecosystems and that's just not, a, not an option. And when I say that about disease resistance, that goes for all the trees that are struggling the beaches with the beech blight, um, even the, the uh, ashes with the emerald ash borer. There's a small population in um, Michigan that uh, apparently has some resistance. So we've got to get this resistance and get, get that to spread to, to uh, get those resistant genotypes into our, our ecosystems. All right, the next question is, our town here in Hanover, Mass, is celebrating its 300th birthday in a couple of years, and our garden club would like to plant trees to celebrate the event. Do you have an oak species to recommend? Um, these days, the um, oak leaf scorch is hitting the red oak group harder than the white oak group. Um, so I would, uh, you know, I'd recommend the white oak. I like white oaks a lot. I don't want to eliminate red oaks. And actually, the farther north you go, the better red oaks do. Um, so white oaks drop out faster than red oaks as you move farther north. So it depends on how far north you are. Um, maybe we'll compromise. How about, if, I don't know how many trees you're going to plant, but make, make three quarters of them white oak and, and one quarter red oak. Okay. I have limited space to plant trees in my yard because of the septic system. 
They are, there are a few native cedars, but should I cut down the two large Leland cypress and Katsura tree to make room for a few oaks? Any tips on removal? Yeah, your saw is a, a very good way to do it. Um, the Katsura tree and, and the Leland cypress are non-natives, they're not contributing anything. If they're really near your septic system, uh, tree roots can mess up a septic system. So that's where people recommend you put a meadow. Uh, with, you know, just herbaceous plants that don't have a root system that's going to mess it up. Um, so any any septic guy will tell you, do not plant a tree over your septic system. And, and I guess I have to respect that. But uh, the, the Katsura and the, the uh, Lillian Cypress, your Lillian Cypress is going to die soon anyway. They grow real fast and then they die real fast. Um, so um, maybe maybe there is room to get in one of those smaller oaks. That would be great. Okay, please share what was the most exciting part for you about writing for about the Mighty Oaks? <laughs> oh boy, that's a good question. Um, I think that the Jay story is just really cool. Um, the fact that they are moving so many acorns in the fall, uh, the fact that they forget where three quarters of them are and they're actually planting so many trees, the fact that it's such an old mutualism, uh, that just was really interesting to me. But there's a lot of interesting things with those. I'll, I'll rank that number one, but I have to think about it because a lot of contenders there. Uh, is there a list of native or keystone species? Yes, I should put that in. That's another talk. Go to Native Plant Finder on the National Wildlife Federation website, put in your zip code and the ranked list of the keystone plants, the, the best, both the woody plants and herbaceous plants that are best in your county will pop up. Um, so that's, that's a good place to start. Okay, I think that's the end of our questions. I'd like to thank you for your presentation tonight. It was very uh, informative and it was just fun. Um, I'd like to encourage everybody to join us for tomorrow's Zoom meeting, which is Climate Conscious Gardening with Kristen Nicholson of Blue Stem Natives. And then on Saturday, we're going to have our first live expo again after three years. So if you could join us at, on Saturday at Kennedy's Country Gardens from 10 to 2, we hope to see you there. Oh, it looks like we got another question pop up real quick. Do California live oaks do the same ecological services? They sure do. Um, California's got a lot of oak species. They're wonderful. They're, they live more in a savanna landscape. <clears throat> um, so yes, they're doing all those things. Uh, plus, they actually can, can serve as a buffer against those crown fires that are so terrible in California. The live oaks don't drop their leaves, and when those embers hit them, it snuffs them out. So people say, I've got to cut all the trees down near my house. Actually, a rim of live oaks around your house can be a real good buffer from those embers that are flying for, for miles. So, um, yeah, got to help those oaks in California. All right. Thank you, Doug. Oh, looks like we got two more messages. <laughs> okay. Um, are they making a comeback? Uh, you know, the resistant varieties are starting to be recognized. We're seeing which ones have died. So the sudden of death syndrome in California has been terrible. But again, there is resistance in all the populations, um, but it's not much. So sometimes it's as small as only 10% of the population, but um, it's there. Those trees are, are now uh, recognized in a lot of places and, and they're the future. Great. Thank you. Everyone's just giving you their praise. I see hearts and things waving. Uh, thank you very much. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. Take All right. Care. Good night, everybody.